I'll start by saying good evening and it's good to see those of you who are out tonight. I know it's fall break so we have some people traveling and I always say it's good to have the opportunity to stand before you but I hate that's because you know Daniel's not feeling well this evening. So Daniel if you're listening we hope you're better soon and back with us. I want to talk tonight about friends. And I bet if I do the title slide this way you'll start to hear a theme song in your head. There's a very popular show called Friends, and I think what made it perhaps so popular was the fact that you have these, uh, this group of, of six friends who are going through, you know, kind of a similar stage in life. They're all about the same age, uh, and the show's really just about, you know, the experiences they have, the obstacles they overcome, and, and their interactions with each other. And it was light, lighthearted and humorous, you know, for the most part, and I think a lot of people could relate with that. You know, they thought about their own life and about things that were going on and maybe they faced similar challenges or overcame things in a similar manner or saw the humor in the situation. But tonight, as we think about friends, had I not put this title slide up there, what do you think about when you think about a friend? What is, what is a friend to you? What is a friend in your life? Maybe you have somebody who's been a friend a long time. Now, we may have friends at work or we have friends at church, but maybe you have some of those relationships, just a few, which have lasted a lifetime. You know, I know Brooke growing up played ball, and even still she'll go out sometimes with her girlfriends that she played ball with years ago, and they'll sit and talk about things they did when they were kids. You remember when this happened? You remember when so-and-so did that? Do you remember when our parents called us doing this? And you think about those things you did as a kid. Or, you know, maybe like for me, you had some of those friends who were church friends who you remember things about. You know, we, we have the kids come running around and playing up here lots of times after church. I grew up in a little country church where that exact thing happened. And I still enjoy going back and seeing those other people who were kids with me that we used to play together and talking about those same things. Do you remember when we did this? Do you remember when so-and-so did that? Do you remember when our parents called us doing this? And remembering those things. And you know, now that I got kids, I, I get to watch them form those friendships. And I look at my kids' friends and think, you know, a few of these will probably last a lifetime. You know, Olivia has little friends at school that she plays volleyball with. A couple of those kids you've probably seen here at church. They come and visit with us sometimes. And she enjoys doing things with those girls. You know, she plays on a travel team. Now, those, those travel teams are a little different. And rec ball is a little bit different because you don't get the same kids every time. So, you know, sometimes those friends change out depending on who's on our team. And it's funny because you can be good friends with one of the parents when they're on your team. But the next year when that parent's on another team, you realize how obnoxious they really are. So sometimes our friends change a little bit depending on the situation. But, you know, she's got her friends at, at school and she's got her friends on her little travel team. Here they are. This picture on the bottom left there is yesterday between games. They're killing time by playing games together, you know, between softball games. And those of you who have kids who are involved in sports or grandkids who are involved in sports, you kind of know the circle of, of your kids or grandkids' friends. And sometimes we just, we meet new people and we just hit it off. You know, yesterday Cal and I got to go to a wedding. And so we get to the wedding, we get there early. It takes about 90 seconds for Cal to find a little friend. That's Grider on the top right corner there. Cal had never met Grider before yesterday. Now, Grider's mom was one of those little kids that I used to run around the church building with. I haven't seen her in, I don't know, probably a decade. And we hugged each other's necks and it was so good to see her and a few of those other friends that I grew up with. And I don't even know the names of these three girls in this other picture that Cal was running around with. But he said, these were his friends. And I said, well, I, have you been good? Have you been nice to your, your friends whose names you don't know? And the little girl on the left there goes, yes, he's been very nice. So I guess he'd been good. But as we're leaving, Cal says to me, 
My new friends that I just met, will I ever see them again? I mean, I hope so. I hope so. I hope you get to enjoy friendships that last a lifetime. Now, some of those won't, but some will. And we hold on to those and we cherish those. Because friends enrich the moments of our lives, don't they? They make the enjoyable even more enjoyable and the unenjoyable a little more bearable. That's how they help us. That's what friends do for us. You know, as a definition, it says a friend is someone who is on your side. A friend is defined as a person that you are fond of, with whom you talk or spend time. And it says, as an example of a friend, is someone you have known a long time and trust. Well, for some, if you're seven, it may be somebody you just met. It seems really fun to play with. But maybe as we're thinking about friendship, we're thinking about those friends that do last a lifetime. Somebody that is always there for us, always there with us. The Mayo Clinic offers this about friendship, you know. The Mayo Clinic is an organization that is involved in promoting good health. And so they say, what are the benefits of friendship? Good friends are good for your health, it says on their website. Friends can increase your sense of belonging and purpose. Boost your happiness and reduce your stress. Improve your self-confidence and self-worth. Help you cope with traumas and encourage you to change or avoid unhealthy lifestyle habits. They go on to say adults with strong social connections have a reduced risk of many significant health problems. If you have Netflix, it may have popped up in your suggestions, a documentary called How to Live to Be 100. And I thought, this is kind of interesting. I wonder what this is. And so it's a documentary where they go into what they call blue zones. And if you're like me and you think, what is a blue zone? I don't even know what that is. So there's these certain little pockets of civilization around the world where in these pockets, the people living in these communities live longer than the average person in the world. And so what they've done in the documentary is they've gone into these little groups and they're investigating, why are these people right here in this one city living so much longer than other people in the world? And maybe we can take some of what they're doing and implement it with the rest of the world so all of us can live longer. That's kind of the idea of the documentary. And if you're thinking it's probably a, uh, well, you need to eat healthy and exercise documentary, I mean, there is some of that, but it's not that. It's not like they're promoting go out and get a gym membership or anything like It's not that at all. But one of the biggest things they say will help you live longer are having a network, an inner circle of good friends. And what was really interesting to me, they talk about faith and people who go to church. And they said, and this was a staggering statistic to me, that people who were in involved in church and had a church family on average lived six years longer than people who didn't have that. Just having that group of friends, having people to rely on, people to talk to, to take the stress off of you, it's good for your health. And we understand that our friends will influence our thoughts and our decisions and our actions, and that our social environment plays a crucial role in shaping our path. You know, there was a popular slogan going around social media recently. It says, show me your kids' friends and I'll show you your kids' future. I think that's true. I think that's true on a personal level. Show me your friends and I'll show you your future. I think that's very true. You know, usually we say this a little different in the high school class. We go to 1 Corinthians 15 and say, do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. You know, evil company corrupts good habits, but good company promotes good habits, right? And good morals, and a good life, and a longer life. So we understand that friends are good, and everyone needs a friend. If you look at Jewish history, the Jews would say that David was probably the greatest person that ever lived, especially those Jews who don't accept Jesus as the Messiah. David is the greatest person that ever lived. So he's this warrior. He's this great king. If you go there to 1 Chronicles 27, he's installing his political cabinet, if you will. And it goes through 34 verses of he appointed this person to this position and this person oversaw that. And you get down to verse 33, and Ahithophel was counseled to the king. And Hushai the archite was the king's friend. Like we don't think about that as a political position, right? 
a friend. But he saw great value in appointing someone who was a friend to him. You know, we go back to our definition. A friend is someone who is on your side. But what does that really mean, someone who's on your side? Right? Does it mean they always take your side in the argument? Like, I've, I've got I've to agree with them on this because we're friends. I'm on their side. You know, what's interesting about this verse, I don't think it's by accident that these two guys are mentioned right beside each other. Ahithophel and Hushai. Because Ahithophel ends up being a traitor who tries to have David killed. And it is Hushai pretending to go to the other side that actually saves David. So you say, well, he's on his side. Well, he wasn't actually on his side. He went to the enemy's side to advise them poorly to help David. That's what the friend did. Friend's not necessarily someone who's on our side, but a friend is someone who always has our best interest in mind. So maybe a friend doesn't agree with us, but the reason they don't agree with us is because they care about us, because they have our best interest in heart. So David appoints a friend. You know what's interesting? Solomon, his son, does the same thing. So in 1 Kings 4, you have here, my heading said Solomon's officials. All of Solomon's officials that he appoints, you get down to verse 5 there. Zabad, the son of Nathan, a priest, was the king's friend. So David saw great value in this. Solomon, who was the wisest man to ever live, saw incredible value to, in this. Solomon advises his son, hey, do the same thing. Proverbs 18, verse 24, hear the wisdom of my instruction. He says, a man of too many friends comes to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Too many friends. He's not talking about good friends. He's talking about associates. You've got too many associates. Listen, Son, you're the king, okay? Everybody wants to be around you. But there's value in finding the right kind of person to be around you. There is an actual friend who's closer than even a brother is, who has your best interest in mind, who's going to look out for you. David understood this. Solomon understood this. Solomon instructed his sons to understand this. Rehoboam, his son, did not understand this. And so when he's getting that advice from older friends, older councils, you know, once he becomes king, the first thing that's dropped on his plate is, can you believe this, taxes. Hey, lower the taxes. And he says, let me talk to my advisors. And the older advisors are like, it's a good idea. You should do that. The people will love you. But his young friends are like, no, don't do that. Tell them you're going to be even harder than, their dad, than your dad was. So he didn't take the good advice, did he? He had some true friends right there in his inner circle who were looking out for him. He didn't listen. The kingdom splits because of it. Everyone needs a friend. Friends help keep us on track. And so I want to think for a few minutes about what kind of friends we need. Well, we need friends that will love us. Uh, Proverbs 17, verse 17 said, A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. A friend loves at all times, right? No matter what's going on, a friend is there for us. And it's interesting, he says, a brother. A friend and a brother. You know, we have different kind of friends, right? I might ask you about somebody and say, hey, do you know this person? You say, well, we're friends on Facebook. But what have you really told me? They're in my inner circle of 5,000 or however many they let you have before they cut you off. They're, I mean, they're in that group of friends, right? We're friends that way. But there might be somebody else I say, are, are you friends with them? And you say, no, they're family. That's what kind of friend they were to me. They're family. That is my brother. That is my sister. We're family. So there are friends, but there are different kinds of friends. And Solomon's making that point. He says, hey, there's a friend that loves at all times, and he's like a brother to you. We need friends that will love us. They love us when we do well, when we're celebrating the high moments in life. And they love us when things don't go so well, don't they? Right? Even when we're not at our best, even when we perform poorly, even when we don't act the way we should, they still love us. But then they push us, don't they, to be better to be the best version of ourselves. 
And you know, we got some single people, some young people who are in the audience. I hope you marry a friend. I hope you marry your best friend. I've always thought it funny when you, you see two people who just get along so well and you think, why do they not get married? And they say, well, we can't get married. We're friends. Uh, who else do you want to marry? I think that's perfect. You mean they can tell you hard things and difficult things and help you when you need help and you don't want to marry that kind of person? I think that's exactly who you ought to marry. I hope that you do. I hope you end up married to your best friend. If you think I'm wrong about that, go ask somebody who's not married to their best friend what kind of marriage they have. Friends will help us. Friends will love us. Friends will stick close to us. Proverbs 27, verse 10, Do not forsake your own friend or your father's friend, and do not go to your brother's house in the day of your calamity. Better is a neighbor who is near than a brother far away. The Living Translation says that verse this way, Never abandon a friend, either yours or your father's. When disaster strikes, you won't have to ask your brother for assistance. It's better to go to a neighbor than to a brother who lives far away. The whole point of this is, they're close by. They are there when you need them. People often use the expression, they would have my back in a fight. Well, you can probably guess about exactly how many fights I've been in my whole life. Zero. But I got really close one time. It was an accident. I was in second grade, so I'm the exact same age as Cal was. And I'm riding the bus home, and the bus breaks down. Now, if the bus breaks down now, they have the good sense to tell all the kids to stay on the bus, and everybody's got cell phones now, so you just call parents, it's not a big deal. They didn't do that. We broke down in front of this house that had a big front yard, and they told all the kids, if you can believe this, get off the bus and play in the front yard. So you've got all these kids who think they're going home who are now just running around in the front yard. And, Seven-year-old Al was a lot like seven-year-old Cal, and he just likes to run around. And you see a kid running, you start chasing him. That's just, it's like the natural instinct of a kid. And so there's this kid who's a fifth grader, and he's running around. I don't know why he's running. I start chasing him. That's what kids do. And that kid, who was a rather large fifth grader, found a hole in the front yard and tripped and fell. I was a fast little seven-year-old, so fast I was right behind him. So when he fell down, I landed right on top of him. And everybody turns around, and it looks like I've pushed this kid down, and now I'm on top of him. And the big fifth grader was rather embarrassed and now rather mad. And if you've ever seen one of those, I don't know, cartoons or a movie or whatever, and it starts happening in slow motion, and you can see the bully, and he's just like, like this, about to just wear somebody out. Like, it happened like that. He comes back, and my cousin, who was a seventh grader, was on the same bus. <laughs> Whew, it was nice to have a friend in that moment. Because seven-year-old Al was about to lose some of his permanent teeth. And my cousin grabbed his arm and said, hang on. It was an accident, man. He didn't mean it. Why don't you go on and go play somewhere else? Man, if he hadn't been close by, that would have been bad. You know, we talk about friends and we think about friends. And you may say, well, I'm friends with this person, and, but, you know, we haven't spoken in a few years. We're talking about the kind of friend who's there in a moment when you need them. Like, they're close by. Hey, we, had, uh, we had, like, a class of party or something uh, recently. And you can tell Cullen that I told this story. So we had like a class party. I can't even remember what we, we bought something. And Cullen comes up and says, hey, I want to pay for part of that. And I said, I'm not worried about it. He's like, I, I want to pay. And I was like, I'm not worried about it. I'm about to tell you why I'm not worried about it. Okay, our kids are in class together. Sometime in the next decade, I'm going to show up at a volleyball game or something and realize I don't have any cash. And Cullen, I'm coming to find you. He's like, I got you. I got you. When that happens, I'm there for you. I was like, I know. And I'm not, it's not going to bother me a bit to ask. We're close enough. We're friends. I don't mind asking you for that. We're talking about somebody like that. Somebody who's right there when you need them. 
They will support you in times of trouble. Ecclesiastes 4 and verse 9. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. For if either of them falls, the one will lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls when there's not another to lift him up. Furthermore, if two lie down together, they keep warm. But how can one uh, be warm alone? And if, and if one can overpower him who is alone, two can resist him, and a cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. You know, a friend is someone who's there for us, whether it's our circumstances or our consequences that are troubling us, they are there. They are there in that moment to say, I've got you. You know, when Jeff makes the call at 714 in the morning or whatever time Stuart said it was, and Stuart, I got it. I got you. And somebody else filled in for class. And then I was supposed to teach in this class. And so Matt's like, I got that. And so when all of you guys went to class and people were filling in and helping, me and Stuart were in the back end of the room going, all right, what are you talking about this morning? All right, I'm going to talk about this. And there's people filling in in the media booth and people filling in, I guess, for counting tonight because we got people traveling. It's nice to have people who will say, I got you. We've got this. It's okay. We'll get through it. We need that sometimes. We need friends who are like that. We need friends who show kindness in times of despair. And I'm not going to spend a long time talking about Job's friends. You know, but Job's friends, it almost seems like they like to hear themselves talk. Everything Job has gone through, I think he just wanted somebody to be beside him and not feel totally alone in the world. And Job says, for the despairing man, there should be kindness from his friend. I've lost something. I need you to be there for me. That's all I need from you. We need friends like that because we lose things in this life. And sometimes it's loved ones that we lose, right? I think you can measure, or at least one measurement of, of a person's life is by the, the quality and the quantity of their friends. Here's one of the great injustices, though. You see that at the funeral home. And the person who's meant so much to everybody is the only person who doesn't get to see that. Who doesn't get to see what they meant to all of us. You know, we'll go stand in line an hour or two hours or whatever it is to hug the neck of somebody for 90 seconds because we loved that person so much. Because they weren't a friend. They were family. That was my brother. That was my sister. I miss them and I love them. And I hate that they don't get to see that. That's what we need, though. We just need somebody to be there and say, I love you. I am here for you. Whatever you need, I've got you. We've got this. Our friends will make our hearts rejoice. Proverbs chapter 27 and verse 9. Oil and perfume make the heart glad, so a man's counsel is sweet to his friend. What makes the counsel sweet? It's the person who's giving it to you, right? Right? Because sometimes the person may tell you something you don't want to hear. So maybe we don't rejoice in the message, but we do rejoice in the messenger, the person who's bringing it to us. Because sometimes that message is difficult. And we need friends that will rebuke us when needed. What does that look like? Proverbs 27 and verse 5, Better is open rebuke than love that is concealed. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. You know, shame is not a bad thing. Our society tells us it's a terrible thing. No one should ever be embarrassed or ashamed or feel guilt or anything like that. I want to tell you that it is a natural response to understanding wrong. You should feel a sense of shame. You know? I love my kids. My kids are kids. As they get older and become adults, they're going to mess up. I know this. And when they do, I hope they feel shame. Adam and Eve mess up in the garden, right? They sin against God. God comes walking. What do they do? They hide themselves. Why? Because they feel shame. There's nothing wrong with shame. Shame is a good emotion. It helps correct bad behavior. And when my kids mess up, and they will, I hope they feel a sense of shame about it. Now, the difference is shame and humiliation 
I want them to feel it on a personal level. They are ashamed. Humiliation is forced embarrassment. That's totally different. And we should never try to humiliate anyone. But rebuking someone so that they feel shame, so that they understand, I shouldn't have done that, is okay. And if I'm alive to do that for my kids, I will. And if I'm not alive to do that, I hope you do it. Tell them this is not right. Your dad would not be pleased with this. But more importantly, your heavenly father is not pleased with this. And you're better than that. It's okay to tell somebody that. In love, that's what we're talking about. A friend does that. A friend will come to you in that moment and tell you that. Friends will make us better. Proverbs 27 and verse 17, iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. They push us. They make us better. You know, and a true friend cares about your eternal being. When I said for the single people, I hope you marry someone who is your friend. I hope you marry someone who cares about your eternal being. Because if that's not important to them, then it may end up that it comes that it's not important to you. But if it is important to them, they will sharpen you. You will sharpen each other. You will make each other better. As we conclude, I want us to consider this. All these things that we've talked about... Jesus is a friend. He loves us. He will stick close to us. There, You will never be anywhere in this world where you don't have access to Jesus. Never going to happen. Not in this world. He, is, he will stick close to us. He will support us in times of trouble. He said, you're never going to find yourself in a situation that you can't handle. He will support us. He will show us kindness in times of despair. He will make our heart rejoice. And He will rebuke us as needed. When you open God's Word up and read in there, it doesn't say you're perfect exactly the way you are. Because we're not. Because we can be better. And Jesus instructs us to make us better. And that's why Jesus said, my teaching will divide. It's not that He is divisive. But when you start telling people you're not fine the way you are, some people will accept that and convict themselves. And some will totally push that, that information away. They want nothing to do with that suggestion. But He will make us better if we let Him. There's a set of commercials on right now. And they kind of show some things that are happening in our, you know, in our world today. And divisive things. And you sit there and watch the commercial and think, what is this about? And at the end, they say, Jesus, He gets us. All of us. And that's true. That's true. He gets all of us. You know? And we're all different. Somebody doesn't have to be exactly the same way that we are. In John 15 and verse 12, this is the last night that Jesus spends with His apostles. He says, this is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. How can we be a friend to Jesus? We do what he commands us to do. Now, sometimes I, you know, I worry that maybe I think that my friends need to look like me and act like me and sound like me. And it's easy to have chemistry with somebody who's a lot like you. I get that. I completely get that. And if you were to look at my core group of friends, they do look and act and sound like me. But I should never be in a situation where I can't look at somebody else who is different than me, who acts different than me, who dresses different than me, maybe thinks different than me, and think, I can't be friends with that person. See, the goal is not to make them you know, look and act and sound like me. The goal is for all of us to look and act and sound more like Jesus. And that person can probably help me with the things that I can't see about myself, and I can help them. That's the goal. That's what we're looking for in friends. I appreciate your attention this evening. We're going to stand just a moment and sing this song of encouragement. If you're here tonight and you've not been a friend of Jesus, why not? Maybe you've never joined the family of Jesus. 
And if we can help you with that, we would love to. If we can help you with anything else, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.